Brock Purdy threw four interceptions. Yeah. Tristan, please tell me this is the final nail in the coffin to put the Brock Purdy media hype and MVP hype to bed. You would think the answer is an automatic yes, but I thought it would be put to bed after the Vikings game, after the Browns game. It, remember, the I, I, yeah. I want to remind you, in case you've forgotten, remember, the Brock Purdy MVP hype started, then he had a couple bad games, it completely fell off the radar, and then it picked back up yeah. again. Okay, I think the only reason it picked back up was because there's no real clear runaway MVP like in years past. Otherwise, it would have been dead when it should have been. I want to preface this by saying the way I've been talking about Brock Purdy. And you nailed you, it. And you too. Well, I did nail it. But he's still a good quarterback. Like, I feel like I'm degrading him. He's a top 10 quarterback. Okay. A lot of teams would like to have him. He has elite anticipation. He operates at a high level. He sees the field well. Um, he leaves, you know, some meat on the bone a lot of the time, but he's a really good quarterback. However, the MVP discussion was always absurd. You can't be the MVP of the league when you're not the MVP of your own team. But for anyone who hasn't listened, what I said was that Brock Purdy plays good when things are going according to the plan. He mimics Kyle Shanahan. We've seen this from Shanahan's career. When they are on script and they're playing with the lead and they're controlling the game, they're better than anyone in the league. Kyle Shanahan is a wizard when they're able to run the ball and really have you scared of the run and they're running effectively and then they can play off of the run with play action and other stuff. They are dominant. They are genuinely unstoppable, like everyone said. However, as we've seen through Shanahan's career and as we've seen through what Brock Purdy has shown us, the moment they face adversity and they can't just run their offense exactly how they want to, and the moment they get behind or they get in a dogfight, the plan completely falls apart. The train falls off the tracks. That's Shanahan and Purdy. Purdy collapses and he falls apart. I've said that. And tonight, finally, I think more people are going to acknowledge it. Four interceptions for Brock Purdy, 18 for 32. It was a disaster. McCaffrey actually had a good night. Um, I, honestly, I think the bigger story of the game is the Ravens' offensive line dominating the 49ers' defense. I mean, Lamar had all night to throw. They just mauled him. It was a complete clinic. But I hope this puts the Purdy thing to bed. He's still a good quarterback, but I'm wrong about a lot of stuff. But this might be the most right I've ever been about a football take. And if you're ever wondering or questioning if Brock Purdy should be the MVP, you mentioned that you can't be the MVP if you're not the MVP of your team. Do you know who bought the entire offense presence? Christian McCaffrey. Not even the quarterback. It's usually the quarterback that provides the presence, right? Right. Well, they did a little thing during the game that McCaffrey bought everybody golf clubs. And I'm like, okay, well, this should tell you something. I know Purdy is not making a ton of money. He's making, I think, less than a million dollars. True. uh, Which that's absurd. I think he should get a bump in pay, and he probably will. But if you, if like, just look at it in simple terms, like, if you're not buying the whole team, golf clubs then you're probably not the mvp (laughs) right uh, amongst other things but that's probably a red flag as well secondly you mentioned they only work well in a positive game plan right i like to call it operation positive script and if that goes wrong then everything else goes to the wayside nobody knows what to do point in case the first three plays that baltimore ran went positive for san francisco it was a three and out their first drive it looked good for the 49ers. They drove downfield unstoppable until Brock Purdy threw a terrible interception in the, in end, the zone. end zone. Yep. In the end zone. About to score in the red zone, and he throws a, the, the worst pick of the night, in my opinion. Um, and then that sent the script completely 180, and now you're at operation. What do we do? Well, well it, let, it let Baltimore get in a position to take control of the game. Because if if the 49ers punch it in for a touchdown there, and then, remember, you had the wacky safety where Lamar... And when that happened, I thought the 49ers were going to win the game. Even though I picked the Ravens, I thought the Ravens would control them and kind of win by 10 or more. I When that happened, when Lamar tripped on the referee and threw the thing, got the intentional ground in for the safety, I thought, I was like, oh, okay, it's like the Raiders game earlier. It's going to be one of those games. The 49ers are going to get rolling. If they had gotten those five points they got early on top of the seven, all of a sudden, you know, you've got a double-digit lead, you're in control, you can take the pressure off your offense. Instead, 
They allowed Baltimore to get rolling. Their protection just gave Lamar time. He found Zay Flowers up like nine times, I think 70 yards. And then Baltimore scored 13 points in the second quarter and really never looked back. They scored 17 in the third and shut San Francisco out. It was really a complete domination after the first quarter for Baltimore. When you talk about great teams in the NFL, is this the only one that stands out to you? The Ravens? Yeah. Yes. I think they're the only they're the only team I would give the elite tag right now. They're, right? There's not another. Yeah. No. There's, I, there's I, good teams, but there's no one that looks like this. You, you would say the 49ers, yeah, there's, there's, but we've seen them do this a couple times. Well, right. Yeah, there's good teams scattered all throughout the league, but uh, as far as greatness goes, um, consistent greatness, I think that the Ravens, you know, they take that trophy there. Um, I think there's other teams that in the next maybe week or two we'll see become uh, maybe elite teams. But as it stands right now, yeah, the Ravens, man, like they just, I, I would be terrified to face them. Absolutely. I do want to piggyback off that briefly, though. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, oh, it's over. They're going to win the Super Bowl because we've seen all the time. The Super Bowl, a lot of times, comes down to who gets hot at the right time. Who gets rolling, yep. you know, the last three, two weeks of the season, like when the Giants beat the uh, the undefeated Patriots, you know, they were a wild card team. They just got rolling, got it hot, and they matched up well against the Patriots. It's Football's like fights. It's all about matchups. You know what I mean? A great kickboxer is not going to do well against an elite wrestler, okay? Even though he might maul the rest of the division, he goes up against that wrestler, he's done. So football's the same way. Matchups make football games. The Ravens are clearly the best team in football. I, I think they're... I think it's them, a, a gap, and everyone else. But we've never seen Lamar go on a, a deep playoff run and really lead his team through the playoffs. That doesn't mean he can't do it. You know what I mean? There was a time we hadn't seen Mahomes do that. And then he did it, you know. And that it, just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean it won't happen. But that is the interesting factor. Just because they're dominant now doesn't mean they'll run the table in the playoffs. Because you look at the AFC, the Dolphins, even though I'm lower on them than some people, you know, they could easily beat them. The Bills could beat them. Obviously, they could lose to the Browns. I mean, because they're divisional rivals. That would be the team. If I'm Baltimore, I don't want to go anywhere near Cleveland. That Those are the teams I look at. I, I don't think it's the Chiefs right now. I think it's Ravens, Browns, Dolphins, and Bills. I think those are the four teams in the AFC playing the best football, right? There's or, And no one else even enters that pantheon. No, I, I completely agree with you. Um also, you mentioned that Lamar has never led his team through a, a playoff run. Well, he's actually healthy this year, so that's a really big ingredient in leading your team through the playoffs. True. Uh, quickly, before we move on to the next topic, you know, Ravens are who they are. We're not surprised. I think Lamar is going to take away MVP votes at this point. It's his to lose, as it should be, even though his numbers aren't the prototypical QB MVP numbers. If we're not going to give it to a running back, like I would... Love if McCaffrey was MVP or Tyreek Hill, but we're probably going to give it to a quarterback, so Lamar. Those teams I just mentioned, Ravens, Browns, Dolphins, Bills. Any chance our AFC representative in the Super Bowl is not one of those teams? No. Slim to none at this point. Yeah, I agree. The only one you would even give a little bit of chance to would be Kansas City. And, I mean, come on, who are we kidding? Not after today. Not, not after today. Uh, agreed. Do the Bucks have what it takes to actually win a playoff game? Likely we'll make it in, but can they win one? Right now, I think they can. I mean, I really do. And it, it's not just a prisoner of the moment thing. I, obviously, we were wrong on the Bucks. We thought they would be one of the worst teams in the league. On the other side, I feel like I, I have been one of the few people that has always believed in Baker Mayfield. I've said on this show that I, I never thought... He wasn't one of the best 32 quarterbacks playing, right? It's like, you're telling me he's not a starter somewhere? Come on. Like, I've seen what he can do. I thought him losing the cocky attitude for a while actually hurt him. And it's almost like Cleveland moving on from him broke him. It really did. But yeah. I'm telling you, what changed him and re resurrected his career wasn't going to Tampa. It was that week with Sean McVay. It was when he got pulled to the Rams on a Tuesday with no practice, played that game, led a comeback against the Raiders, I think it was, and 
it, it was impressive. It put Baker Mayfield in a new light. And that football game gave him a chance in Tampa. They gave him a one-year deal, a prove-it deal. And in my opinion, they'd be stupid not to sign him to a multi-year contract. Is he one of the best quarterbacks in the league? No. But you can win football games with Baker Mayfield, especially in the NFC. And the last, what, two weeks he's been playing absolutely outstanding. I mean, he, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league right now, at least over the course of the last two weeks. And I know it's not like elite defenses or anything, but if they're playing like this, they can win a lot of football games. Like you mentioned, you know, the past couple of weeks, Baker Mayfield has been uh, outstanding. He played the best game of his career last week, went 22 for 28, and uh, just really just kind of walked up and down against the Packers right. and then really did the same thing today against the Jags. So I think Tampa has every shot at taking on anybody, really, and and delivering a heavy blow. Now, can they win a playoff game? I, like you said, right now, I would say yes. Well, think about um, this too, man. But, they're going to be they're, they're, if assume they it holds and they win their division, they'll get a home playoff game. So if yeah, if it holds right helps. now, they would actually host Dallas. So Dallas would be going to Tampa and. I'm yeah. not picking Dallas without any thought. I think Tampa could beat them for a hundred percent. They could win that football game. Well, look, the weapons at offense is tremendous on both sides. If you're talking Dallas and, and the Bucks, right? right? That that could be a potential you know offensive shootout. Um, but it, it really, in my opinion, if those two actually played, it would come down to the defense as what defense right. stepped up right. and and kind of sealed the game. Um, and I may give the edge to the Cowboys with because they have a secret weapon called Micah Parsons. Sure. Um, and he's phenomenal. Defensive player of the year, I hope. Talking about the Bucks and uh, their playoff uh, contention and, and how they'll shake out, look, whether or not they can win a playoff game, they've gone so far above what I thought they would this year that I'm happy. Like, I, And the only Bucks I know in a playoff is Tom Brady Bucks, right? So... Like to even have the Bucks go into the playoffs, which you know they're going to win their division and they're going to make the playoffs and probably have a home uh, home spot there. But we thought they'd be picking uh, top what, five in the draft. If, if you're if you're a Bucks fan, like you you can't be too let down, right? Like even if you don't win a playoff game, like since Tom Brady, you thought it was going to take years to right. rebuild. I mean, there were rumors of Mike Evans leaving, and then like, where's Godwin going? Even and, this season, right, a couple, a few weeks ago, before you yeah. know, early in the season, Mike Evans, the whole contract thing, what was going to happen? Now, you know, Mike Evans, another great year, solidifying his position in the Hall of Fame, and what Baker Mayfield's doing is getting the ball to playmakers. That's what he's doing yeah. so well. He's he's just delivering the ball accurately to his playmakers, to Mike Evans, to Chris Gotten, to uh, the tight end Kate Otten, who I think is underrated. I actually really like him. Rashad White. They, Rashad White, man. The, come on. I, I actually think there was a point in the season that things changed for Tampa, and I think it was when they actually started leaning on Rashad White, not just in the run game, but in the pass game. When they started to, saying, we're going to utilize him it, oh, as a receiver as well, and it took off from there. He's so good. Uh, there's two uh, players, two running backs specifically, that are underdogs of the year for me, and that's Kyron Williams and Rashad White. Like those two guys, if uh, which I had both of them at one time on my fantasy team, got rid of one to you actually gave you Rashad White. Helped. You're welcome. Those two guys, man, are they embody what it means to to be looked over and to actually put your money where your mouth is and show up and play football because both of those guys, man, are just they're tremendous. And uh, the, the Bucks are rolling right now, unlike the Jacksonville Jaguars. Okay, so the Jaguars got embarrassed, humiliated by uh, the Bucks, but it's not even the Bucks; it's the fourth straight loss. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, you know, clears concussion protocol, comes back at the last minute, plays terribly, and then has a shoulder injury. We got, you know, still pictures of him looking like Mr. Magoo. It is, you know, code red in Jacksonville. They're leading the AFC South right now because the Colts and the Texans both lost. I, I, I want to ask, does it? Does it feel like the season's over for the Jaguars? I know they're still leading the AFC yeah. South, but it feels Not like it's over, right? Yeah, I don't think they're going to be leading the AFC South for long at all. <laughs> um, matter of fact, I think the Colts are probably going to overtake that spot uh, and probably win out because the Colts are kind of on this weird hot streak right now. I don't know. I thought the Texans would be here, but C.J. Stroud being out it really hurt it them. It really derailed them, yeah. Still, still, I mean, they're all tied right now. They're all eight and seven, I think, yeah, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so... Um, it's anybody's ball game except for Jacksonville. Like they're they're not going to get better, Tristan. Like let's just be real; they are not going to improve in the next two weeks Mm-mm. to 
to make it in uh, to to win the division for the AFC they, South. They can't improve. They, they, they've got too no. many issues. It's not something you overcome. Yeah. I want to go back to preseason when we made a video about the Jags, and I said, and you said, we both said the big question and the worry for the Jags was the offensive line. We got comments saying we were idiots. We don't know what we're talking about. The Jackson, by the way, correct. But we were out on that issue. What's been the big issue for the Jacksonville? It's been the offensive line. They've been the bad. Jacksonville. And it's not just that. Calvin Ridley hasn't panned out the way they've really wanted him to. Trevor Lawrence hasn't played great. I, I don't, I'm not putting it all on him. The offense doesn't look creative. It doesn't look like the Doug Peterson offense. I, mundane. And the, def- mundane. the defense isn't great. They haven't stepped up. I'm just I'm a little bit baffled. I, I'm, I'd love to I'm go not. back and watch some like film after the season and see what happened. But after last year, where they took the Chiefs down to the wire, they made that playoff run. Ryan, how does it get worse in Doug Peterson's second year with Trevor Lawrence? I, I don't know where it went wrong. It, yeah, it, it would take a fiery plane crash to get any worse than what it is right but now. But doesn't it feel like all the pieces are there? It feels like on paper it should be worse. Even you know, well, with the questions on the offensive line, it feels like this should be an AFC South winner and a contender in the playoff. And right now it feels like they're going to lose every game they play. Yeah, it, it does. Um, really, ever since they're... They're, you know, the, the past four weeks. I mean, they won against the Texans, twenty-four to twenty-one, in a, in a close one. Yeah, and they beat the Titans pretty handedly, uh, and got embarrassed by the 49ers. So, you know, and then since then they've lost four games consectively, week to week to week to week. And I don't really see. And they haven't been like, close. You, you tell me. You, you, okay, they have a pretty good shot at beating the Panthers next week, but it could be a sneaky game. They could screw up and lose it. Absolutely. And then the Titans with Ryan Tannehill, somehow they're rejuvenated Tannehill right now. Tannehill or I Levis. I don't care uh, who plays. I, I, yeah, I, either right? one of them. They're interchangeable right now. Um, but yeah, they're, they're they're getting a new fire under them. And look, there's a chance that Jacksonville doesn't make the playoffs at all, man. Like, honestly, because you got to look. The Colts, I think, are going to win the division. You think? Because who knows? Well, I mean, if Stroud comes back next week and wins out and the Colts slip up and lose one, I think, possibly. I think Stroud's out for the year. I think they're going to play it I safe. Do, I do, too. So. But uh, that that aside, the Colts are probably going to win. The Texans may move up uh, above the Jags, right? And then you got to look at the rest of the AFC for wild card slots. Well, and the Steelers are eight and seven. The Bengals are eight and seven. Uh, the Raiders and the Broncos are kind of on a hot streak. They're both seven and eight right now. Um, and then you know you got my Bills who are nine and six. So yeah, it looks to me like the Jags are out of the playoffs completely. Potentially, see, I, I don't. I, for some reason, I, I guess it really depends on that Carolina game. Like I, I don't know what makes me think they'll rot the ship. the The only thing that gives me a little bit of not even comfort, but hesitation on saying they're done is they have lost to good football teams like Baltimore, Cleveland. Okay, the Cincinnati one, whatever. But and Tampa Bay is looking good right now. But but they shouldn't get embarrassed like they did in the interceptions. I mean, Devin White made them look like a fool. But if Jacksonville wins out, if they beat Carolina and then they go to Tennessee and beat the Titans, that's it. They've won the AFC South. What my point being though, say that happens. Just go ahead. Hey, b- take your imaginary pen. Go ahead and check mark them two wins, okay? They win those last two games. They finish 10-7. and seven. They win the AFC South. They're hosting a playoff game. They ain't winning that playoff game. So that's my whole point. Even if they win out and win the division, which totally could happen even with all how bad they've been, there's no way they're beating one of these playoff teams, right? You think well, that the Browns yeah. would come in there and stomp the crap out of them? The Bills, the Dolphins. Yeah. Hell, I don't think they could beat the Chiefs right now, man. Yeah, and that's saying something. Right. But look, uh, and I know we're probably over time here, but I just want to touch on these two things. Yeah, so yeah. Houston and the Colts, right? So you look at both of these teams and you look at the remainder of schedule. Well, Jacksonville has the best remaining schedule possible because they play the Panthers and then the Titans, okay? Okay. The Texans play the Titans and then the Colts. And the Colts play the Raiders and then the Texans. So really, if you're ranking strength of schedule, it goes Jacksonville, Houston, Mm -hmm. and then the Colts. Yeah. From least to best. Right, right. So it could come down if Jacksonville slips up. Uh, You know, we talked about the, the Bills and Miami having a showdown to who wins the division. It could potentially play out this way for the AFC South here, too, because if Jacksonville slips up and loses one game against the Panthers or the Titans, either which one, 
and the other two teams win their Week 17 game, and then they go to a, a, you know the Colts versus the Texans in the final week, that's your playoff match for the winner of that division. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's so. It, it, I, and I say all that to say the long winded way of saying it's gonna it's gonna be a shakeup on multiple fronts for these division winners in the AFC. NFC, I feel like, is kind of solidified a little bit. Yeah. Right. AFC still kind of up in the air for a lot of teams because a lot of teams are coming on hot right now and they're really good teams are taking a little bit of a step back. Right, exactly. It feels like, it, it almost feels like a game of hot potato with playoff spots, but not in a good way. It's like no one wants it. It's like, no, you take it. You take it. I it's mean, hopscotch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've taken so the Jaguars have had so many chances to just run away and like take the lead in this division and they just won't do it. And the fact that all of these three teams lost this weekend, it's just, it's a joke. I mean, the AFC South is way better than we thought they would be. Uh, Shane Steichen, arguably coach of the year. What he's doing is impressive. I think ultimately, though, regardless of who gets in, even if it was Houston with a backup quarterback, which I don't think is happening, Colts, Jaguars, whoever it is, they're basically hosting a playoff game and getting one and done, right? They're, I just, yeah. th- there would have to be such a drastic turnaround. I feel the same way about the Jags as I do the Chiefs. It's like at this point in the season, you know, when it's week eight, week 10, we say, hey, you know, you say, say it on broadcast, they're, they're going to have to figure some things out for sure. After week 16, I think, you know, we figured it out. Like, we're not going to have some <laughs> right. giant change in week 17. And it's not like Jacksonville is losing by three to 10 points. And, oh, we just, you know, if, if we could could just not turn the ball over, that's where we lost the game. I mean, they, they're getting cleaned from first quarter to the last. 60 minutes, they're getting walloped. So I, 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 you don't fix that in the course of a week. I don't know if you fix that in an off season. We're going to look at the hottest team, who we think is the hottest team in the NFC, AFC. The way I'm kind of looking at it, the team, if you were in the playoffs, you don't want to face. Like, you're just hoping the way it pans out, the draw, you do not want that team. Ryan, who's the team in the NFC you don't want to play in the playoffs? Yeah, it's going to be the Los Angeles Rams, led by Matthew Stafford, my friend. Uh, This team is hot right now. You know, we talked about Kyron Williams earlier in the episode, uh, Let's talk about him again. I mean, he's on fire right now. He's just, he's one of the, I think he may be one of the leading rushers, if not the leading rusher in the NFL right now. He it's is crazy. So and, good. And he's, and he's mi- people forget, I don't because I'm his fantasy owner. He missed a few weeks yeah. with an injury. Right. And he's still one of the leading rushers in the NFL. Imagine if he was here the whole year. How great would that have been? One of those not, late rookie picks that the Rams hit on, man. Yep. Not just him, though. Everybody on the Rams team is coming on right now. Matthew Stafford is playing his best football I've seen in a long time. Just as good as the Super Bowl year. Yep. Deadly accurate. On a rope on every throw. And Puka has really stepped up and kind of taken over the team since Cup's injury or, Mm -hmm. you know, he was out for a couple weeks and then Puka kind of just stepped in and he's the guy. Cooper, last week, dropped a couple of touchdowns. Yeah. So, you know, I think Puka is the guy. He's obviously the new age guy. Cooper is probably more the second guy now, I think, in, in Matthew Stafford's progression looks. Um, and then also, what's the other guy's name? Um, uh, the 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 third receiver on the team, uh, Demarcus Robinson. Thank you, uh, myself. But yeah, Demarcus Robinson's also a, a really star talent, that wide receiver. There's just a whole lot of things happening with this Rams team that I don't think anybody expected to come on this late in the year. Um, but the way they are playing right now, I think they're the deadliest team in the NFC right now. And if I'm anybody in the NFC, I'm terrified because there's not one team that I would stack them up against and say, no, there's no chance they win. Dallas, I think they could handle them pretty well. Ag- agreed. And by the way, let's not just limit to the NFC. Let's go back. Oh, God, how long ago was it? Oh, wait a minute. It was just like a week or two. They took the Rams. Uh, the Rams took the Ravens into overtime. Like yeah. they're on the verge of win- lose the game on an overtime punt return for a touchdown. And go back and watch that game. One of the games of the year, the Rams and the Ravens, they went toe to toe. And we've seen in Baltimore. Look, they just shut out San Francisco and embarrassed them. The Rams can beat San Francisco because they're in their division. They are, by far, I agree, the hottest team in the NFC. They look so good. Matt Stafford, because of the injury and because of the way last year was, and we didn't see a lot of him, when we did our top 10 quarterbacks in the offseason, we didn't put him on there. Not because we thought he fell off, just because of the injury and stuff. We didn't know if we'd see him. We If we'd see him come back and be healthy and play a full season. Well, he's back. He's playing a full season. He's as healthy as he's going to be, and he is easily a top 10 quarterback, again, as we know he is. This season, 
almost more so than his Super Bowl year, makes me just realize how much I've underappreciated Stafford his entire career. Yeah. And I, like the, the Lions, man, did him dirty. Dude, their Super Bowl year, like he was great. Don't get me wrong. But this year, it, like that game against the Saints on Thursday, uh, he made so many throws that literally leave your Side jaw on the floor. Throws. It just he drops the ball in a bucket, layer it over a defender. Deep. 30 yards on an out route and just land in your hands. And him and uh, Cooper Cup haven't been quite on the same page. I don't know what's up there. Their connection just is a little bit off. I don't know if it's Cooper. I don't know if it's Matt. I don't know what's going on. But that's been okay because Puka Nakua has been such a revelation. Okay? <laughs> I went back just for fun and listened to our preseason uh, predictions where we discussed the NFC West. And when we got to the Rams... You were a little bit higher on them than I was, but we both were like, you know, six, seven games max, best case scenario. I said in the episode, the only way they're going to turn this ship around is if they hit on a ton of rookies. Well, they hit on a ton of rookies. There you go. And, and that, there you go. It, Kyron Williams and Puka Nakua uh, we'll on their own, not, not counting all the other players that have played a role. Sean McVay, he's not going to be considered for coach of the year because there's too many other candidates like Dan Campbell and stuff, but... He should be, and he's reminded everybody. I think he's reinvigorated. I really do. I think all the talk about him leaving and going to TV, which he, he kind of brought on, you know, he genuinely was close to retiring. This is a reinvigorated McVay. That offense looks as good as anybody in the league. Stafford's fantastic. Naku is a revelation. Kyron Williams is probably the best back in the league right now. I think the Rams could easily run through the, not easily, but if you told me today the Rams were in the Super Bowl, I wouldn't be shocked at all because they're getting hot at the right time and they're playing their best football at the end of the season. They look like a good, good football team. Speaking of getting hot, we just mentioned that the AFC is a continuous game of hot potato. Let's talk a little bit about couch potatoes because I think I know your team that you think is the hot one right now in the AFC, which would be? It's going to be the Cleveland Browns. Um, and who is their quarterback? The couch potato himself, Joe Flacco, put down his golden flake to just come off the bench and start slinging dimes everywhere, uh, giving Amari Cooper a record-setting day in Cleveland. This, in my opinion, is the most shocking thing of the year. It's all, it, and I'm flabbergasted. We, we've, we haven't talked about the Browns a lot, not because we haven't respected their defense. We've talked about it a little bit, but it... Almost, it, they've gone so under the radar. Yeah, like for some right. reason, like I just don't think about the Browns on a week to week basis. Oh, but they're there. And, and yeah, you look up; they got nine, ten wins, and they're gonna be a, a, a force to be reckoned with. But so we've known all year their defense is one of the best. They beat San Francisco early in the year. We kept kind of writing them off, like, oh, well, you know, played good that game, they played good that game. But the offense has got to catch up with them. No one saw. The yeah. Flacco coming off the bench thing. They're on their fourth <laughs> quarterback. But, but, but it's not just Flacco coming off the bench. He's better than Deshaun Watson. The, the, this is the difference. The Cleveland defense is still what it's been all year, but now they actually have an explosive offense. What? Uh, wait, you're right. telling me you're giving me that defense with an explosive offense that can score at will? Oh, my God. Are you saying a Super Bowl contender? Because I am. Yeah, okay. Is Flacco going to throw two picks a game? Absolutely. He is. Okay, I can live. But he's got eight touchdowns. Right. So. I can live with the interceptions when you're giving me all the big plays. Deshaun Watson was throwing picks, and he wasn't moving the ball downfield. You know what I mean? If Flacco's going to throw picks, but he's going to give me 350 yards and four touchdowns, we can live with it because our defense is so good. That's why it's kind of a match made in heaven. They The defense is good enough to balance out the mistakes Flacco makes because d dude's going to sling it. He does not care. He lets it rip. Let's not forget yeah. he is a Super Bowl well, winning quarterback. And what did he? When did he win the he? Super Bowl? When he had the Ray Lewis defense. So now he has this Baltimore defense. You're telling me he can't do it? You're not watching football. The Cleveland saga has been amazing. In my opinion, if I had a vote, Kevin Stefanski would be coach of the year. Wouldn't even be close. I wouldn't consider voting for anyone else. If I told you at the beginning of the season that Joe Flacco was going to play the end of the year for the Browns. And they have a really good shot at making it into the playoffs and even winning a playoff game. You would have thought I was crazy. Right. You would have thought I went off my rocker and had joined a cult somewhere called Flacco Unanimous. If you told me Joe Flacco, if, if, if you just said, hey, Joe Flacco is going to be the Cleveland Browns starting quarterback in week 17, I would have said, well, they're going to be looking for a new coach next year. 
Absolutely. But remember, before the season, me and you said this was a make it or break it year for Stefanski because when the organization goes and spends that much money on Deshaun Watson, not that you know Stefanski necessarily had anything to do with that, there's not going to be any grace, right? It's like you're going to have to get it done or we're going to get somebody else in. The season, think about how many obstacles have been placed in his way, Ryan. Think about it. The Nick Chubb injury. Deshaun Watson goes down. Your backup goes down. Your third string goes down. You have to call in a a 47-year-old off the couch, and you have got this team playing the best football in in the past 20 years? I'm telling you, I think that's why they've gone under the radar, at least for me. Like with all these injuries, I just kind of, I think I wrote them off, but they're, they kind of remind me of this sinus infection I've had for about 18 days. <laughs> it's like I forget about it through the day, but every morning when I wake up, it's there. I've been under that fan it's all not going night away. sleeping, and it's just right here front and center, and it feels like I could just bury my head in a pile of sand and feel better. Um, but throughout the day, it's fine. I don't worry about it. It's gone. But hey, right, they're right back there the next day. That's how the Browns have just done. They have taken punch after punch after punch, and they keep standing back up and going the next round. And, buddy, I'm telling you, th- this could be like that. Th- this is the dark horse of the AFC, if you ask me. A hundred percent. I mean, at a certain point, they just stop being the dark horse, right? I mean, at a certain point, you just have to buy them as contenders. The the, the games they've lost, they did lose to the Rams December 3rd. Okay, They lost to the Broncos. They beat the Ravens once, lost to them once. And, and as I said earlier in the episode, if they play the Ravens, they can, you know, divisional opponents, I promise you, the Ravens are praying they don't have to face Cleveland in the playoffs. They're just praying that they get knocked out the first round because they are deadly, man. They could beat any football team. I I, I, I haven't heard enough praise for Stefanski. I, I feel like the dude's not getting his flowers. How, how do you not consider him a top five coach in the league after this? This is one of the most impressive seasons I've ever seen from a head coach. I'll tell you what, all of our fans, if you donate five dollars to this channel, I promise we will send flowers to Kevin Stefanski. They're gonna be cheap flowers. But we're gonna send them. <laughs> we're gonna take some of that profit well, you send. Gotta out, put put some back on the bank again, right? He'll he'll get a he'll get a dozen from Publix. You know, let me ask you real quick before we sign off. He won Coach of the Year like two years ago or whatever. You think there's any chance they're giving him the award or you think they're gonna get like I I, no. I don't think he's gonna get it because he won it no. so recently. No, I, but I think they just do, they do st- stupid things in deciding these awards anyway, and I just uh, I think he's going to be overlooked. He shouldn't be. I agree with you, uh, but yeah, I think it's probably going to go uh, to another another person. Like Dan Campbell's a, a good one. Uh, if- I think it's pretty much Dan Campbell, just because they they won the division for the first time in thirty years. Which, by the way, hey, cool, but th- that's not as impressive as what Stefanski has done with a fourth string with a guy that was on the couch. Antonio Pierce would be, I know that won't happen, but that would be cool because he's, he could win it next year. Yeah, he could. It's, Give him a full year, he, he could win it. We'll see if Mark Davis is actually willing to do that. But uh, right now, I, I agree with you. Rams are the dangerous team in the NFC. Browns are the dangerous team in the AFC. If both teams win out the rest of the year, look out, man. Look out because those are the teams that can win Super Bowls. We've got a couple good matchups. Before we sign off, Ryan, What's the game you're looking at next week and you're circling, you're most excited about? Which one is it? Yeah, for me, it's got to be the Dolphins at the Ravens. It's it's time to see if the Dolphins can actually stack up and finish out a game and close it out. Um, they kind of are a little bit slimmer, similar to me, uh, to the 49ers, where if they don't have that positive game script, if Tua gets pressured, if he's put in a in a, in a dark spot right. where, where he has to play out of... Um, it it doesn't usually shake out well yeah. for them, you know? And the Ravens are hot. And their defense is good. And it's at Baltimore. So, yeah, it's going to be a, a, a tough task for Miami. I'm really interested to see how um, the game turns out. My, um, I, I want to know, if, if I could look into the future and see the matchup, I want to know if Miami is able to get pressure on Lamar. Because... the. The, a lot of the Ravens' success is coming from how good the offensive line is playing, and Lamar has forever in the pocket. Plus, you put on top of that his ability to maneuver within the pocket and run around and buy time and make plays. Miami's defense has been coming on lately. They sacked Dak four times. Can they get to Lamar and bring him down? I think that, that to me, that's the stat you got to look at, and it tells you everything. If they can get sacks on Lamar, get pressure, they win the football game. Yeah. If they don't, they, uh, they have no that'll chance. Help. That'll help. I think for me, though, um, what you got to look at is 
uh, can what what team is going to have the running back with the most yards? I think that's going to be, um, uh, or at least the the leading rushing because Lamar is pretty much a running right. back, right? Um, actually, he's been a lot better this year about not running and actually using his arm. Yeah, but they don't but, really have a running back they can rely on at this point. That's the that's well, other than Lamar. And and here we go. Here's Lamar. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, I think that if uh, Miami gets their running game going early, um, I think it could be really scary for for Baltimore. I think they could put up a good fight. But um, it, yeah, it, I think if Mostert and A Chain, uh, in 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 combination can get rolling early, um, get them ahead, you know, a touchdown or maybe ten points, I think it could be tough for Baltimore to have to come back against this defense after what we've seen the past couple of weeks. I mean, it's a really good defense right now. It, it is, but man, I, I just, Lamar can strike at will. They can yeah. they can hit 30, 40 yard plays just like that. You know, you can get them on third and 15 and he can run around and find Zay Flowers for 35. I mean, th- that, that's what the they problem. did to San Francisco. Right. I, I think you have to disrupt him. I think the only way is making him get the ball out fast and hoping it works out for you. I'm, I'm excited to watch that one, but the one I would put right above it because I just think the Ravens are going to handle him. I would put Lions at Cowboys. It's a fun one, man. Because I don't know uh, who these teams are. Like, I know who they are, but I don't know who they're going to be in the playoffs. It's like the Lions are the team that has so much talent, and they, they're they the big story, and they've won the division first time in 30 years, and they're going to have a playoff, a home playoff game and all that. Like, amazing. Congratulations. I love it. But it has also been a roller coaster ride. You know what I mean? They'll have a game where they play great, and then they get you know demolished by the Six Ravens. Six points against the Ravens, and then yeah. they'll do really great, and then Chicago will beat them, and then they'll do good, and then they'll be in a dogfight with the Vikings and barely win it because Nick Mullins throws you know twenty picks. So the Lions are good, but they're inconsistent. They're up and down. They have games where their defense just disappears. They've been you know kind of bad on the back end, and the Cowboys you know have had trouble on the road. But this is a home game for the Cowboys. I kind of predict Dallas might. Uh, bounce back and win this game because Ryan Dallas is coming off two losses lost to the Bills lost to the Dolphins you can't if you're Dallas you can't lose this game and then even if you win next week you know it, you can't go one and four in the last four games of the season and hope to have any momentum or you know make a deep playoff run I think this is a crucial game for Dallas if they lose it then obviously they're still going to make the playoffs but they're not going to feel good about it so I think we're going to learn a lot about the resiliency of both teams it's going to be tough. Um, I, I heard, I think it was maybe Cowherd or maybe Chris Sims say that uh, the Lions need to start incorporating the run more. It's like they, they used the run earlier in the year, then they backed off of it through the middle of the season, and now it seems like maybe they're trying to incorporate that more into their mm-hmm. offensive playbook. They need to. They have to rely on Montgomery, Gibbs, to run the ball, do dump-off passes to Gibbs, oh, right. and get him out in the open. Uh, that's That's their key to success. It's not playing from behind and letting throw in 60 times. Yeah, I agree. I, matter of fact, not that. I think you need to l- l- take away carries from Montgomery and start giving them to Gibbs. I think Gibbs is such a playmaker. He needs the ball more. Feed Jameer out in Gibbs. the open. Give him the ball. I think G- Gibbs out in the open is dangerous. He's so fast. Montgomery between the tackles I disagree. is, I think, I, right now I don't a know. little bit better. I, I think Jameer Gibbs is better all around. I really do. I think he just is yeah. such a forceful runner that it doesn't matter. And that's been one of the things with the lines. It feels like they're still kind of managing reps. I understand using them both, but I want to see uh, more for Gibbs. So we'll Who see. Who wins? Who wins uh, the Lions game? Yeah. Cowboys. Bye. Just for fun. Double digits. I think, wow. I think it's set, like it's in the fourth, by the time the fourth quarter's halfway over, you know it's over. I think the game will be over. Well, the Lions are coming off two pretty big wins against the Vikings and the Broncos, so it is about time for them to Hit that dip right. in the roller coaster. And, and it's the opposite. The Cowboys coming off two losses. This is a gotta have it game for them. Cowboys have to win this game. And it's at home. Right. So they'll do good. Thank you guys for everything. Make sure you like the show, subscribe, tell your friends about it. We appreciate it. We'll see you next week talking more football. Be safe, everyone. Merry Christmas. Goodbye.